Ready? All right. Hi, everyone. I'm John. Glad you guys could all make it. Um, so hopefully you guys uh, were able to see the first webinar, but for anyone who, who missed out on that, just a really quick overview of, of what we think of as Arctos. Um, it's a, basically a consortium of about 124 different collections uh, from 25 different institutions. And the, the shared instance that we're in is, is serving data for about 3.2 million uh, specimen records of natural history and cultural history uh, material. Um, and then there's a separate, share, a a separate um, individual instance uh, at, at MCZ at Harvard, and they're serving another 2 million specimen records. Uh, so not, not only is Arctos uh, a collection management system, um, it's a research-grade database. And equally as important, it's, it's a community of curators, collection managers, and researchers um, who are all, all really driving to, to make this a really great uh, research system and, and you know, for use in collection management, education, um, and research. And we're continually bringing in new collections. And, and this leads to a really dynamic system where um, as we get new collections in with new ideas and new needs, um, we're able to build new tools and, and functionality for the system. So uh, we really are looking at this as a, as a community that we're building uh, together. Okay, so today, um, we're going to kind of break this into four parts and that I'm going to spend a little bit of time in the beginning just going through uh, basically general searching uh, that, that the public would be seeing when, when they're coming into Arctos. Um, so basically pre-login searches. And then Marielle will take over and as a, as a logged in user uh, with different rights and, and abilities, uh, she'll show you different types of searches that, that we do in terms of collection management and such. Um, and then Kendall will take over and she will focus more on uh, projects, publications, and cultural collections. And then hopefully we'll have a, a good amount of time at the end uh, to answer questions and to, to do uh, searches that you guys might be interested in seeing and such. So, all right. So this is the main, main page. And the search page you can get to from here. And this is what the public will see when they come in. And so this is your, your, your basic search page right here. And so it's, it's broken up into a couple different areas. So identifiers, so catalog numbers or uh, personal collection numbers, uh, tissue numbers, you know, whatever your collection potentially uses is here. I, IDs, taxonomy, uh, localities, date collector, so basically agents, we call them. Um, information on, on the individual records, usage, so this is where you can, you can uh, search based on, on citations or, or loans and such, uh, media, and relationships. And, and the majority of this is not stuff that, that the public is going to be using. It's, it's more geared towards uh, the curatorial staff, and Mario will get deeper into that as, as we go. So I'm going to just do a couple easy searches here to show you what 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 the public typically gets when they when they come in here so um, if we start out and you and someone knows exactly what they're looking for and they come in and they just want to find information on a on a specific record you know they can just go into catalog number and in, input a number and you can actually put multiple numbers in here if you like you can there's you can use either spaces or commas here but we'll just put this in just to show you what gets pulled up. Okay, so I knew what, what catalog number I wanted, but I'm actually searching everything that's in the system, right? So I was looking for MSB uh, 55245, which is here. But we also got all these other records of you know, all the other 55245s in the system, okay? But this is the typical result page that you would get. So if I go to the actual result here and pull up that record, this is what we have. And this is one of our kind of our gold standard records because it demonstrates um, all the potential material and data that can be tied to a single individual. So locality information, um, publications, genetic sequences, parts, projects, 
different collectors, and associated media. So this is this is what the public can actually see going in. So the public has basically, for the most part, they get the same, uh, for the most part, the same data that that we get as as managers at, at some level here. Okay. Okay, but usually users, public users coming in are actually uh, just coming in um, wanting to know, you know, maybe, you know, what all of one taxon do you have? Or maybe they don't have any taxonomic background at all and they're, they want to search just on a common name. Maybe this is like a, a K through 12 teacher that's interested in, in, in doing something uh, for their classroom. And so we're going to use spotted bat. Okay, because that's, a, that's a, a cool bat we have here in New Mexico. And so someone could put that into the ID and taxonomy field and pull that up. And eventually they would get some results. Okay, and we got 87 specimens. Well, that's interesting, right? So these are not all spotted bats. Right? So we've got fish specimens from a couple different collections. And so while you can get in here with common names, it's really critical to know that common names um, are shared lots of times. Right? And so these fish are actually spotted batfish. Okay? And so, um, so there needs to be some level of understanding when you're doing these kind of searches as to you know, what really you're pulling up. So I wanted to show that for that exact reason. Okay, so if we go back and instead of using spotted bat, we actually use the scientific name. get 71 specimens and you can see on these you can associate various things with with each specimen record so these some of these say voucher and so that means that that, that there's a citation associated with these specimens okay and this gives me all the uderm maculatum available in arctos okay without any restrictions That's probably more than, than potentially we want. And so in order to, to reduce that, um, we, can, we can do various things to, to uh, uh, restrict our, our search. So we can keep that. But then maybe we just want the spotted bats from New Mexico. So very simple. Search, um, narrowing it down by, by geographic element. We'll reduce it. And slowly. Okay, so that reduces it to just our New Mexican specimens. Okay, well maybe we, we want to reduce it even further. Okay, I, hadn't, I was avoiding breaking these down anymore, but I'll just go ahead and open some of these up just to show you that the public coming in can use the very, very minimum here, but if you'd like, you can, you can get to a lot more uh, detail even as a public user. So each one of these larger groups can be broken down and searched on in any number of, of other ways. So the, the number of combinations of searches gets really, really large. Okay, so just as a quick search here, we will do a date range.
There are many thousands of different combinations you can do. You can search on any, you know, any combination of fields that, that we have access to here. Okay. Now another option is maybe we are interested in Uderma that have molecular data associated with them. Okay, so Arctos can tie to other databases. And so we can we can go in and we can select GenBank, for instance, and we can pull out any Uderma that have sequences that have been sent to GenBank. Our database talks directly with, with GenBanks, and we can go back and forth there. Okay, so here's this individual with a whole bunch of GenBank numbers, as well as the publications that submitted those GenBank numbers. So again, we're tying everything closely together here, which is really critical for tracking these data down the road. I think Marielle can show, she can toggle back between, no, okay. Okay, so this is the idea here. We, we can go right to the GenBank um, accession. And people in GenBank, you know, they could be searching GenBank and not know anything about Arctos, uh, but they can come to a record and then they can see the link out within their record and it'll take, a, take, take them back to Arctos. So um, a really critical aspect about Arctos's capabilities is that it, it, it does have these reciprocal relationships with other other databases. And ISOBank is another one that will be coming up in the near future, we hope. Okay. So the other thing you can do is you can you can bring these data up um, in a, a lot of different manners. Okay, so we can we can search and bring these up as specimen records, like you I've shown you uh, just before, or we can bring them up as a map, for example. So all the georeferenced specimens that were in our result can then be plotted on either uh, Berkeley Mapper maps or we can also go directly into, you can download uh, KML files and go directly into uh, Google Earth as well. Oh, sorry. We can also summarize them. Okay, so I can take all my results and break it down by however I want to break it down. So. Maybe we'll sort these by state. And this is useful for reporting purposes. There's a whole bunch of different reports you can you can download and use in Arctos. But you know when it, when you're when you're doing you know some kind of summary reports you can break it down however you'd like and, and you can go to the individual uh, records there's, that are associated with each of the different categories. Or you can simply just graph it. So a lot of tools available even to the general public. And this is just a fraction of what we can do as managers once you get into the lower levels into the more advanced searching capabilities. Okay. Okay, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna log in here as Marielle. <laughs> the 
just to show you some of the ways you can manipulate your specimen results you know when you're when you're logged in and, and how you can then do downloading and such Okay, so I've got these 47 specimens, and maybe I'm not interested in all these specimens. So I go to my tools toolbar here, and I can either remap stuff if I would like, but maybe I want to remove some of these some of these specimens before I do a download or before I before I save this search. Okay, so I can go in here and I can select some of these specimens, and then remove them from my specimen results okay and then that, that just gives me a, a smaller set but maybe I'm not seeing all the data that I want to see either okay and so now I can go in and I can customize everything that I want to download so I, I can select any or all of, of these fields and it will, it will provide me you know, the full data set on all these specimens okay so I can add in okay, so maybe I want forearm length for these bats that I'm looking at and I only want to see uh, the parts that are associated with these Can't get to my reload. Can you see it on there? It's buried. And then you just save it and refresh it, and it will provide you with the extra data fields that you're interested in or not. Name is already in existence. Okay, and then so that adds on the extra data fields that you're interested, potentially interested in, in downloading. And now I can download all those data. So, okay, whether I'm doing research or educational personal, so you've got to select something. And you need a profile for this. So this is where, where the public can't can't download. They can create them. Can, they can create um, a, a login though, and it's not hard for them to do. John, uh, but you can't download unless you actually have. Yes. For some reason, um, Adobe Connect is not showing the download window that is po a pop up on your screen. Um, so you might okay. just want to talk through what that is. Okay. So it's a it's a CSV file, basically like an Excel file, and it has all the all the fields that you've selected. And so then you can use it as you would use a, an Excel file or a CSV file. Uh, you can sort it however you like to sort it, uh, cut, paste, um, export, whatever you would want to, to do with that. Awesome. So that's one way to, yep. Now we're back to seeing everything you see. OK. So another thing you can do if you don't specifically want to download is you can save your search or you can archive those results for future. So um, if I want to archive my results, I basically just name something, name that, that search, and it will provide me um, a, a copy of that in my own archive. And I can come back to that, that saved search whenever I would like. And this, so the archiving actually saves the results. If you do a saved search, it, it, it saves um, your search itself. So that's, kind of dynamic. So if new 
uh, material is added in down the road, that will be integrated into, into this search. So if you want all the Uderma from New Mexico and we catalog something tomorrow, um, that search will then um, have that if you go back to that in the future. And you get to this by going to My Stuff and then yeah, and then manage your saved searches. And they're all in here. And this is particularly useful if you get queries um, that, you know, if someone asks you, you know, if they can't do the search themselves or if they're interested, if you've got some number of specimens of, you know, for, for a loan request or something, you can do a quick search. Um, you can save your search and then you can easily just email it to them and they'll have access to, to that, that full set of records. Okay. So that's the basic overview of really simple searching. <laughs> um, and now Marielle is going to stay logged in and break down each of those different categories to a, a more specific searching ability. Thanks. Thank you, John. And while we're switching to Marielle, I just wanted to make a point that you don't have to be an Arctos institution to have a uh, Arctos account. You can have um, you can create an Arctos account where you could be able to save searches and do that sort of stuff just as a, a public user. And now here's Marielle. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah. Um, so on that same subject, the public can, of course, download uh, results but they have to have a login and the reason we require that is so they accept the terms and our licensing and their use of data so there is the click I accept these terms when they download information and that requires a login I have myself several logins I have one that will allow me to go in as a public user and then I also have another one that I can use as an operator where I have more restricted access uh, to different collections but that I have um, I'm a, have the ability to edit records so if we go back to the um, main search screen again, I should go back up here, which you can get to from this page just go by going up to specimen search. Um, one of the things I want to to sort of mention now that you're I'm logged in, first off, you can I can see a lot more tabs here because I am logged in as um, under my operator login. And so I have the ability to do data entry or bulk loading. I have all these other tools, et cetera. That also gives me more control over um, the types of things I can search on. I can still go back and minimize all these and see kind of the, the general um, public map. But what? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, but I have also got access to curatorial tools. For example, down here at the bottom, I can search on a barcode. I can search on a loan number. I can search on something I use fairly often is everything that I entered yesterday <laughs> or everything that a student entered yesterday because maybe there's some problems that I need to go back and correct. I can pull that information up, uh, anything, um, different operator logins. Um, I, so I have a lot more access and searching tools available as an operator than I do coming in as a public user. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, if you look here, uh, I have as an operator, I have access to a number of collections, but just this is a, a, a subset of the entire number of collections. If you were to go in as a public user and click, click on collections, you would see all of the collections in Arctos, and you would be able to search on all those, but you wouldn't be able to edit them. Whereas uh, I can, now that I'm logged in, the collections that I see are only those that I have editorial access to. So sometimes if you forget which login that you're in and you're in your own login as an operator and you search on something and you don't see it, it's because it's only you don't have access to that collection. And so you have to go come back in as a public user. Some of the other tools that are useful, and, and some of these are also available for, to the general public um, that I'd like to, to point, point out, are this Requires Tissues button. This is useful. I'm a collection manager for genomic resources, so I frequently have to tell people, go and click this button here uh, to require tissues. Um, and also, we can have, um, once we expand out this taxon name, I can ask for things that are specifically identified as a particular taxon right now or that have always, that has ever been identified in that way. I can match using case sensitive, various other terms. We also have um, identification here in very, at the classification level, uh, higher classification. 
I would caution, however, when you use this, that um, not every collection uses the same classification in Arctos. We don't require everybody to use a consistent classification. You can be using NCBI or Arctos or a variety of other uh, online classification systems. So if you use order, for example, and you're using, you know, I'm a parasitologist, so not everybody agrees on the order of various parasite orders. Um, I might not get everything by choosing some of these higher classifications. So just be aware of that depending on what you're trying to find. The easiest way, of course, is this top line, any taxon ID or common name. We also do not have common names for everything in Arctos, and as John said, they may um, end up being um, used for different taxa. Uh, some other things here on the any, any geographic element, we have a variety of different things that you can use for search tools. We have this Google map, which you can either show or hide. Google map can be queried um, using text or also this uh, a box, which allows you to uh, create a particular area that you want to query. I'm going to try to limit this down here to New Mexico. Okay, somewhat in there, Mexico. Okay, I'm going to put in... Um, Mexican wolf, our lobo, which is our mascot here. Um, using this tool, I'm requiring tissues. Um, I may also want to have um, a part. Maybe I want something that um, has a skeleton as well as tissues. Um, so I might ask for a skeletal element. Or I might ask for um, a whole organism, or I might, uh, want, might want something that is a voucher in a publication, uh, or a paratype, or what have you. Um, media, maybe it, I want something that has an image associated with it. Or relationships, this is something that we've developed in the last couple of years. Again, as a parasitologist, I find this very useful, but it's useful across collections. Um, anything that was collected with something else, eaten by something else, the host of, or a parasite of something else. Uh, that can be added in here. You can create linkages and relationships to other individuals or other cataloged items in Arctos or to, um, as, as John mentioned earlier, to other databases. And then again, the curatorial information. So let's just do this really quickly, this one search, and see um, we have a fair number of, uh, of wolves, in the, or Mexican wolves in the collection. Okay, so this is, again, our parameters. If I want to see what my search terms were, I can go up here and click on this box, and it tells me what exactly I searched on. I searched on Canis lupus bailii, um, and I searched on um, that I required it to have tissues. I searched on geographic elements related to this box that I created, and um, I can also add filters and add rows from here without having to go back to the other page. Now, as John mentioned earlier, um, you can, since I'm, down, I'm logged in, I can download from here, I can save this search, um, can customize how things are displayed. The general public only sees a few rows. I have a lot here because I choose to see a lot of content. And that's also what will be downloaded. Once you're in this screen, you can uh, search, you can sort on any column by clicking on the column header. Also be aware that uh, down here at the very bottom, there is a row count. So I'm seeing the first 100 of these 427 specimens. However, I can choose to see 5,000, um, let's just say 500 here, or I can go from one page to the next at this, from this screen. One thing I would like to show, let's see if we have any of these um, relationships, um, related items. Here we go. So this one here shows relationships in Arctos. So this particular wolf is the parent of another, uh, of several other individuals. And so if I click on this, this is a live link that will take me out to this related individual, which is the offspring of the parent that we just saw a minute ago. The same situation works for parasites and hosts. This will also work across collections. So these two uh, samples happen to be right now in the Museum of Southwestern Biology. We have the, the, the parents and the offsprings of these wolves. But I can do the same thing for a parasite in the MSB parasite collection that has a host at Berkeley or at Alaska. We're able to go across collections within Arctos. 
if, for example, I have a parasite here in New Mexico and the host is at the Smithsonian, I would can put the Smithsonian's catalog number here and uh, create that linkage. But the only way I'm going to get a reciprocal linkage back is if the, the Smithsonian has a URL that I can link to. Uh, so this, in order for the IDs to be able to go back and forth, we need a URL, URL for that linkage, um, which is what we have when we have uh, the GenBank link that John showed earlier, such as this. So these are linking back and forth to through URLs. If the Park Service had one, we could link to there. Okay. All right, so um, one of the other things I wanted to show with this screen is that as logged in, I also have access to uh, loans and accessions. I can see this accession here, all of the individuals that came in. In this case, it was just one that came in with a particular accession. I can get a list of specimens related to that accession. I can um, also see loan inf information. Let me go back to my there's a list over here. No, no specimens. OK. Um, one of the things you'll see is Arctos opens us a lot of tabs. <laughs> you can get lost in your tabs, or it's actually quite useful because you pull up information and it stays there, and you can go back to it later. Um, let's see if we have anything under here that's immediately loaned. Um, anyway, I want to show you uh, projects as well, and I think Kendall's going to go through searching for this. Um, we have collectors and agents are all controlled vocabulary. These can um, be searched as well. So here's an agent, um, some in information on agent act agents and agent activity. Let's go to editing. So we have search boxes for agents. So if I go to um, my name here, I can search on various people. And in addition to seeing a person's name, I can see what they have done in Arctos to be able to decide is that the same person that I'm trying to link a record to. I have information on projects, different versions of their name, addresses, etc. And then also can look at agent activity. Which should hopefully come up in a minute. And again, um, I'm only seeing what I'm allowed to see through my login. So I have relationships, groups, addresses, specimens prepared, projects, publications, etc. So this is a very useful way of tracking information um, and, and identifying agents. Agents can also be searched on through uh, the search screen up here, as well as we have the ability to search on publications and projects. I think we have one of these that has a project. Here we have the U.S. Mexican Wild, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service Mexican Wolf Recovery Program associated with our, our uh, wolf samples. I can reach this from the specimen record. Uh, this is visible to the public, how many specimens were used, how many were contributed, projects using these specimens, uh, media, etc. Um, and as login, since I have login access, I can also edit this. I can add how much funding was received, what are the sources of funding. Um, National Science Foundation, for example, could be a um, sponsor. So it's a way to track um, projects and publications, et cetera, together. Again, I think it, uh, Kendall's going to go through this a little bit more. And what else have we got to search here? Search on taxonomy, um, media and documents. I'd like to show some of our media. This is, uh, if I wanted to search on Robert Rausch, who donated his parasite collection to the MSB, and we have a lot of his field notes. I want to search on his ledger. Once it stops working here. We can also include audio and video. Um, if I go to one of the pages of this multi-page document, you can see this is his the first page of his collection ledger where he examined various animals, in this case chickadee, for parasites, and he recorded what he found. 
Um, I can download this copy and um, I can download the media itself. These are um, TIFF files and I can copy them, open them in a new tab, be able to zoom in on them. Over here. Also, I, you can see that these are these have tags in this media. So the tags back over here, but there's control. There's one of the records. Okay. And go back over here to the tags. These tags go to a particular catalog item. And by tagging the media, I can go directly to a catalog item, which is this host, this uh, Canada J that was examined by Rausch in 1949 in Gardner Creek, Alaska. Looked for parasites. He did find some parasites. Here is the parasite that he found, a filarial worm that's now cataloged in the, um, the parasite collection. Also down at the bottom, it's tagged in media. From this record, I can go back from the media to the tag on his original ledger. So these are very easy to create, these tags. So they're also searchable, again, by the general public as well. Some other search terms are, um, what's that? Yeah, I think we're almost done. Um, Geography, we can search on uh, any higher geography, um, geography terms. Um, and we have access to our code tables online for the general public as well, uh, so that you can see the vocabulary that's, that's controlled. Um, Mary Ellen, I think we should pass it over to Kendall at this point, um, but I think we're, we're leaving people with the right impression, which is you can do a whole lot of searching in Arctos and apparently more than we can even begin to cover in an hour. Okay. All right. I will pass it over to Kendall and hang on just a second. And for those of you that are participating, Kendall's going to talk a little bit more about searching for cultural objects, which Arctos also has the capability to handle. Um, she's going to talk a little more about projects and publications as well. If you have any questions that you know you'd like to have addressed in the webinar today, it would be helpful for us if you could type them in the chat box so that we can kind of gauge how much time to uh, let Kendall run with or if we should stop and um, address some questions. But please, if you have something to add, type it in the chat box. And take it away, Kendall. All right, I'll try to make this quick so I, since I know we're running out of time. So I'll start with projects and publications. So this is right under the specimen search. You can click on it. And we usually create these when people request tissue or a loan from us. And we can type in several different, anything about the publication that you could possibly be interested in. I'm going to type in Gunderson, who's the collection manager here, and search for his name. And what it pulls up is the five publications that are linked to him, and it shows that he has 90 cited specimens. And then the project, and if you click on the project, it will also have not only like the principal investigators, the graduate students, a description of the project, any of the publications that are linked to it are also here. It also has the specimens used, so the specimens used in these, this project. What's been contributed to it, so they went out and collected 196 specimens for this project, and then also projects that have used these specimens. Um, another thing you can do with projects is already search for, for National Park Service. So we basically create a project for different agencies, and so all the specimens associated with a National Park Service for UAM mammals is searchable, so they have this data. There's 9,439. It will let them know the usage. It's a great thing to have handy for agencies. All right, so that's pretty much a quick thing on projects and publications. And then if we go back to the specimen portal, so this was designed for biological collections, but we have cultural collections that are entering into our into Arctos. Um, we have an ethnology, which is pretty much a you know Alaskan modern history, and then archaeological collections, and then our fine arts collection is joining um, in the process of joining. And so most of the stuff that you can search for, like location, accession number, catalog number, you would do the same, but a little bit different that are not intuitive. So 
any taxon name. It doesn't have to be, as John pointed out, it doesn't have to be, you know, spotted bat. But let's look up parka. And I put an equal sign in the front, so that way it pulls up only things that are labeled parka instead of, like, parka squirrels, which are ground squirrels. Because we are actually looking for the actual ja hooded jackets made of animal skin. And so then it brings up all the different parkas that we actually have in the collection. And then if we go back, we can also do show and the search terms, but you can also edit your search terms and do re-query if you're interested. So then another place where you can search for it besides the taxon name is if you scroll down to biological individual and you can pick attribute. And you can do, there's abundance, there's age classes, there's build depth, anything that you're kind of interested in. If you want, you can search here. And some things that people wouldn't think to be under biological are going to be, let's see, the culture of origin or culture of use. So if you type in that, you can do equals, contains, greater than, and then we're going to type in Aleut. And this is a in Alaska. You can do Athabasca and Inuit. And so that will bring that up. And that searches. Hey, Kendall. So it brings up her specimen. Yeah. Carla has a, a, a good um, question that I think we should address while you're looking at this is that when you were searching for parka, you searched in the identification versus the part names. Um, so if, if at some point while you're talking about the searches, if you could talk about why that is so for cultural collections. Okay. Well, actually, it doesn't matter. So what was the question? So it really doesn't matter if I searched in this field or this field. If I search equals parka and identification, it'll also come up. It doesn't matter which field I search in. So if I search here, it's going to get the exact same results. Yeah. So it actually doesn't matter which of those identification fields that you search in. Yeah. And so these are the ones that are in the attributes. So if you go back down to attributes, there's also like material. So if it's made out of wood, you can also search on description. So a lot of times they'll have an object that's described how it looks like if it's, yeah, just a description like it's made out of moose hide. Um, you can also search for mater material for that. Um, the provenance, the depth, they have the depth which is like if you're doing archaeological dig, you can search for that. Um, both of our archaeological and ethnology departments have documents on how to search for these collections. And then once I unshare my screen, I'll add those links to the, the chat. And another thing I'd like to point out, if you come on here and you have no idea what a tissue is, you click on it and it'll bring up a tissue and arctos is defined as. You can even do more information or look at controlled vocabulary. That's same with any of these. So collection, it'll have a definition. So you don't have to know what all these are. The, the definitions are there for you. All right. And I think that leaves about 10 minutes for questions. Perfect. And we have a question from Beth about linking projects, linking one specimen to multiple projects. So she says, for example, if you have a project for an agency and then a mass die-off project on some of those specimens. She wants to know, is it possible to link one specimen to, to link one projects? specimen? I believe so, Mariel. Yes. Yeah, you can link. Specimens can be linked to yeah, as many absolutely. projects and yeah, applications. Absolutely. Yeah, so we'll see. Yeah, I'm trying to find an example here. Um, let me pull one up. Okay, here's an example. Can I share my screen real quick? Yeah. Request it. Okay. So this is that um, endogalomies that John was. Um, 
Oh, this is one of the bats. Okay, bat. It works too. <laughs> so here down on this bat, you can see all of the. It's contributed by a couple of projects actually. So it can be contributed by more than one project. The USGS uh, specimens in the MSB, also the National Park Service, and um, etc. But it was used by multiple projects as well. So you can link as many projects. And every loan that we create, we, we create a project for that loan, and then automatically links the um, the the things that have been loaned and publications that result from the loan to the project. Does that answer your question? And that's why we harp on people to sign our specimens, is so we can create these linkages. <laughs> exactly. So I think the projects are great for tracking, tracking use. Um, and of course, one specimen can be used by many, many people. Um, I also wanted to return to, to that differentiation that uh, Carla was wondering about. Um, Mariel, can you go back to the search screen so we could look at uh, for cultural objects when we're talking about the part name versus the identification? Mm -hmm. um, okay. when, when we're thinking about uh, part names for most biological specimens, we're thinking about is it a study skin, is it a skull, is it a tissue? Um, and when we're thinking about part names for cultural objects, we're usually just thinking more generically for now. So, Mariel, you could search for for equals parka again, maybe. And we'll just look at a specimen record. One thing that I think Arctos does well. One of the problems is that I am. Oh, yeah, you're logged in. And I do not have access to Alaska. Um, so, yeah. um, so I'm reading, I can I'm reading Carla's over. question now. Down. Yeah, let me say. So the the Carla's question is why it's not a part like a liver or skeleton, and the reason is because they're all listed as objects. The part is always called an object. So when she pulls it up in the part table, it's going to be listed as an object instead of a parka. And this is one thing that I think this illustrates something that I really like about Arctos, which is that in the future, maybe the cultural collections will get together and decide that they want to have a controlled vocabulary to make object more specific. So, you know, it's not an object, it's a article of clothing versus a piece of furniture. Um, and Arctos can totally handle that. Um, but for now, all these things can still be cataloged and searched. It's just that they might be able to be cataloged and searched better in the future by work done by the Arctos community. So Carla's next question, if I was interested in parkas made out of a specific species of mammal, could you do that? So the way you'd have to do that right now is you would type in parka, equal parka, and then go down to the biological attributes and type search under material. So or actually description would probably be better. So under pick an attribute, go down, one more down, and you would do description, and then you would type in like moose hide, or moose, and then, or caribou, and that would bring up, because that's, yeah, under description. Okay. I would type in contains caribou. Yeah, and it's important to put contains because if it is just just caribou, then it wouldn't. Yeah. Cindy's asking how many cultural object collections are in Arctos right now. Kendall, do you know that off the top of your head? Um, I have no idea. I know our ethnology collection is. I know another institution has their ethnology collection. We have archaeology and our fine arts, but I don't know how many objects they have. At Chicago, we have our scientific history and uh, models collections entered as an ethnology collection in Arctos. I think that's well, one I it's mostly Alaska that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting and making Arctos friendlier for cultural object collections. Kendall, do you have a record that has the description of caribou? 
because it looks like we were timing out due to the extensiveness of the search. I'm just wondering, I, we also used to be able to like type Willow Basket, for example, up here, and it would search on Yep, on both Willow and Basket. Can we do that through this field as well? Let's try it. It depends. So the description, yeah, the description is a, it's what the people entered in. And so it's a text field. So if they didn't enter it, then, yeah. So one thing to, to note to everybody that if you're doing multiple searches and you get are getting unexpected results, sometimes it helps to just go and clear this form um, because you might have some hidden search term that you're searching for that you don't want to be included. And as uh, Kendall mentioned earlier, always be aware that you may be searching. If you're searching on is and you're not getting what you're looking for, try contains because uh, it may have been entered in a different format than what you're looking for. Um, let me just look up. Try something else there and see. Any other questions that we can address while we're waiting on this one? Carla says, I also think that the VertNet folks have been testing how to deal with cultural collections as well. She's wondering, Kendall, if you know anything about that um, and if cultural collections might be available on the VertNet IPT. I am totally unsure about that. Do you know, Kendall? Yeah, I have not heard anything, but I mean, that would be really nice because I've had graduate students that are looking for even cultural objects made of this specimen to know that they were in that area. Um, I don't know if they have, I'll ask, but I don't think they have, but that would be really a good thing to get done, to have done. And then Beth is also wondering if anybody knows examples of classroom lessons that use the Arctos search function, and I, I know we do. Um, Mariel, you guys at, um, you guys have lessons at MSB, right? Yeah, the AMAP, AMAP website has a lot of modules. So AIMUP was a, a project to integrate collections in undergraduate education. I also know that one of our collection managers, Teresa, at um, University of Texas El Paso put together a video on searching in Arctos that she is using with her classes. So I'll try and find the link for that. There we go. So yeah, we have some up here on the WAMUP site. Um, I think there is Island Biogeography, it's an Arctos-based tutorial. Yeah, so this, this link at the, the Island Biogeography module, for example, uses Arctos data and, and gives information on how to incorporate Arctos in the classroom. There are a few of them, I think, in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we look, at, look under these um, modules and tutorials. Okay, introduction to using Arctos there. Oh, thank you, Teresa, for sharing that, that link. Beth, if you're interested um, in using Arctos for, for your undergrads, I know there are other people in the Arctos community that would be as well in sharing resources. So you should think about reaching out to the Arctos email list. We're just about at the end of the hour. If anybody has any last questions, you could put them in the chat. Otherwise, I want to remind you that um, by filling out this post-webinar survey, which I just linked, you can keep attending these webinars last minute without having to register for them, which I find very helpful. Um, so iDigBio is kind enough to host these for us, and this is how we can help them continue helping us. I also want to say thank you to John and Marielle and Kendall. John and Marielle especially had a lot of technical problems and still managed to put on a great show, which is always a little nerve-wracking when you're doing a live demo. Um, so thank you to all of them.